Hi everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas Neurologist from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we will talk about a very very interesting and exciting topic the consciousness and coma, the important concepts. Coma is a deep sleep-like state from which the patient cannot be aroused. The consciousness has got two important qualities. One is the arousal or alertness that's a primitive function sustained by brainstem. Second is the cognition or the coherence of thought that requires an intact cerebral cortex. So consciousness got, has got two qualities, arousal and cognition. Very important to understand the concept of consciousness. We need to understand a system known as reticular activating system or RAS. The maintenance of consciousness is by a special thalamocortical alerting system termed the reticular activating system which is diffusely located in the brainstem and projects to both the cerebral hemispheres. So the consciousness is because of the reticular activating system which is present in the brainstem and goes diffusely to both the cerebral hemispheres. Therefore, coma can be produced either by structural causes or metabolic causes. Structural causes, there should be damage to both the cerebral hemispheres. One cerebral hemisphere, if there is a damage, it does not result in loss of consciousness because the other cortex compensates it because the reticular activating system goes in the brainstem and goes to both the cortices. So both the cortices should get affected for a person to lose consciousness. If one cortex gets affected like MCA infarct or, or thalamic hemorrhage, person does not lose consciousness. Both the cortices should get affected or one cortex with raised intracranial pressure and edema should go and compress the other cortex also. So both the cortices should get affected for person to lose consciousness. If one cortex gets affected, person does not lose consciousness. A very important clinical point. So structural damage to either both cerebral hemispheres or the brainstem. Even if the brainstem gets structurally involved also, person loses consciousness because the RAS is so close together in the brainstem. So structurally, if the brainstem gets affected, the RAS gets affected because it is so close in the brainstem or both the cortices should get affected because RAS goes diffusely to both cortices. So unless both cortices get affected, person does not lose consciousness. If one cortex, like a big brain tumor, big MC in fact, they do not lose consciousness. So very important clinical point, structurally either both the cortices should get affected or the brainstem should get affected for a person to lose consciousness and go into comatose state. So not only structural causes, even metabolic causes can cause coma. So as long as the RA is intact, person remains in a conscious state. The moment RA gets affected be it by structural causes like tumor or infarct or metabolic causes like glucose or oxygen, person loses consciousness because RAS depends so much, RAS and the cerebral neurons depend so much on its survival. So they depend so much on oxygen and glucose for its survival. Therefore, when the there is hypoxemia or hyponatremia or hypoglycemia, person loses consciousness. So metabolic causes, suppression of the reticulocerebral function by drugs like anesthetic drugs, toxins, metabolic derangements such as hypoglycemia, anoxia, uremia or hepatic failure, the RAS gets affected and person loses consciousness. A very important point we need to note is that metabolic causes of coma are far more common than structural causes.
metabolic cause of coma like hypoglycemia they are far more common than structural cause of coma in fact any person who comes to casualty in a comatose state we need to always suspect hypoglycemia because it's a highly treatable condition the moment we give dextrose the person sits up and even talks to persons even before we completely before we complete giving dextrose so one of the important and treatable causes of coma a very common cause is hypoglycemia right now a question comes why antihistamines like clofenramin maleate or anticholinergics like amitriptyline they produce sleep as side effect why should antihistamines and anticholinergics produce sleep as side effect the answer is that the fibers in the ras reticular activating system are histaminergic cholinergic adrenergic dopaminergic and serotonergic therefore stimulation of the ras produces arousal and inhibition of the ras by antihistamines or anticholinergics therefore produce sleep as side effect so antihistamines and anticholinergics produce sleep as side effect because they inhibit ras or reticular activating system right suppose a person comes in a comatose state what all are the important points in history taking what all should we ask from the patient's attendance to get to know the cause of coma if the history is of sudden onset person is already suddenly person loses consciousness and becomes comatose we should always suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage or seizure disorder suppose if it is gradually or fluctuating in onset we should suspect subdural hematoma in fact elderly patients might even have forgotten the trivial injury but then they could have ruptured veins and the blood might be slowly trickling down for few days and slowly starts accumulating because it's a venous rupture a venous tear so blood slowly starts accumulating subdural hematoma so there will be a gradual or fluctuating onset of loss of consciousness so gradual onset of loss of consciousness we need to suspect subdural hematoma or metabolic encephalopathy like hyponatremia where there will be gradual loss of consciousness suppose there is a history of pre monetary transient symptoms we should suspect transient ischemic attack person might have had symptoms suggestive of ischemic attack then recovered transiently lasting less than 24 hours of or 1 hour and then recovers and then gets back again we should suspect tia transient ischemic attack suppose there are focal signs preceding loss of consciousness we should always suspect structural lesion rather than a metabolic process always remember that when there are focal signs it would be structural cause like tumor hematoma or infarction on one side it causes focal signs on the opposite side but if it's a metabolic process usually it is diffuse bilateral and diffuse so if there is focal signs which is preceding loc we need to always suspect a structural lesion, lesion rather than a metabolic process if there's a history of fever we need to suspect infectious process it could be it could be meningoencephalitis if there's a fall and then a sudden loss of consciousness it could be intracerebral hemorrhage because of that person has lost consciousness and has fallen down if a person has got confusion we need to suspect a metabolic or toxic etiology and always history of trauma cardiac arrest and drug ingestion are obvious and we should always get to know about it right having got important points in history now we need to do a general physical examination and try to know the cause of coma heart rate if there is bradycardia it could be because of heart disease or increased intracranial pressure which is known as cushing's reflex where there is bradycardia hypertension and abnormal respiratory rate or rhythm we call that as cushing's reflex it is because of increased icp so when there is bradycardia we need to suspect heart diseases increased icp or intoxications when there is tachycardia we need to suspect infections or hypovolemia as a compensatory mechanism blood pressure if there is hypotension it could be myocardial infarction
it could be intoxication like ethyl alcohol or barbiturates or it could be sepsis if there is hypertension we should always suspect intracerebral hemorrhage intracerebral hemorrhage one of the most common causes is hypertension especially if the hemorrhage is in the putamen pons thalamus and cerebellum it could be a hypertensive bleed so comatose person with hypertension always suspect intracerebral hemorrhage then i said as i said earlier cushing's reflex there could be hypertension bradycardia and irregular respiration so hypertension it could be increased icp or renal diseases also can cause an increased blood pressure and can result in a comatose state next is respiration we need to check out on the breath order if it is acetone it could be dka diabetic ketoacidosis it could be ethyl alcohol if it is fetal hepaticus or uriniferous could be uremia a garlic order we should suspect arsenic poisoning if a person is hyperventilating it because it could be because of hypoxemia or hypercapnia or acidosis or sepsis if a person has got hypoventilation it could be because of overdose or hypothyroidism that is myxedema right very interesting is in comatose person by observing respiratory pattern we could even localize the site of the pathology suppose there is a herniation or any pathology coming from the rostrocaudal direction by observing the pattern and changing the pattern we can analyze the ways the rostrocaudal descent takes place for example what happens in the cortex and then as it descends to the midbrain and then as it descends to the pons and then finally to the medulla oblongata so if there's a herniation or hematoma in the cortex it produces chain strokes breathing cortex a waxing and waning type then so a waxing waning type is known as chain strokes respiration once it comes to midbrain it becomes central neurogenic hyperventilation they hyperventilate once it comes to pons it becomes apneustic breathing they take a deep inspiration pause and then expire deep inspiration pause and then expire that is apneustic breathing in pons once it comes to medulla oblong that becomes totally chaotic breathing what we call it as biots breathing irregularly irregular breathing so we can as the herniation descends from the cortex to the medulla oblongata rostrocaudal descent we can see these respiratory patterns evolving and nicely changing so cortex it is chain strokes respiration midbrain it is central neurogenic hyperventilation pons it is apneustic breathing and medulla oblongata it is biots breathing right a person who is in a comatose state if he has got fever it could be infection inflammation or a hypothalamic lesion heat stroke thyroid storm or subarachnoid hemorrhage likewise if a person's temperature is on the lower side hypothermia it could be sepsis shock myxedema coma drug intoxication like barbiturates or hypoglycemia fundus very important is to do a fundus examination in a person who is comatose for example if there is increased intracranial pressure it will result in papilledema so once we see papilledema then we can suspect that person may be having an increased icp subarachnoid hemorrhage produces subhyoid hemorrhage if it is hypertensive encephalopathy there could be exudates hemorrhages vessel crossing changes that is av nipping or papilledema diabetic retinopathy also produces characteristic changes like neovascularization so fundus examination is very very important in a comatose patient then we look at the head and neck if there is scalp laceration he might have sustained trauma if there is battle sign that is ecchymosis over the mastoid or raccoon sign ecchymosis around the eyes they both suggest basilar skull fracture if a person has got neck stiffness it could be meningitis subarachnoid hemorrhage or cerebellar tonsillar herniation then we check out on the skin if a person has got cyanosis it could be hypoxia cardiac diseases or cyanide if it is cherry red
in color it could be carbon monoxide intoxication if there is jaundice it could be hepatic encephalopathy or hemolysis if there is pallor it could be anemia shock or hemorrhage if there is ptk or purpuric rash we should think of meningococcemia if there is sweating we should suspect hypoglycemia as i said earlier hypoglycemia is one of the common and treatable cause of coma therefore we should always be suspecting hypoglycemia in in any person who comes in a comatose state and what is the clue he'll be having sweating why is there sweating in hypoglycemia when the glucose goes down body tries to increase glucose level by producing counter regulatory hormones so these catecholamines which are counter regulatory hormones along with glucagon so these catecholamines not only increase the glucose they have other side effects of uh, catecholamines that is sweating so because of these counter regulatory hormones which not only increase glucose level they produce other effects like sweating we can get a clue that the person is having hypoglycemia so comatose patient sweating we should always suspect hypoglycemia if there is erythemia it could be polycythemia or alcohol if there are bruises there could be trauma or it could be because of a coagulopathy heart we should always examine heart because there could be arrhythmias which could have given rise to cerebral embolism and stroke or murmur valvular heart diseases gastrointestinal system it could be hepatic encephalopathy or gi hemorrhage producing shock and comatose state genito urinary if there is urinary incontinence we should suspect seizure with postictal coma because of seizures usually they may have urinary incontinence so person might have been having seizures with urinary incontinence of there is cerebral hemal embolism there could be hematuria extremities if there are subtle twitchings we should always suspect subclinical status epilepticus so if there is tonic clonic movements it is obvious we can pick it up and 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 say that is the status epilepticus and person is in a comatose state because of seizures but sometimes the tonic clonic movements are not obvious so we have to carefully look at the extremities and watch for subtle twitching which is diagnostic of subclinical status epilepticus very important in physical examination is posture the decorticate rigidity and decerebrate rigidity very important decorticate rigidity is arms flexed and legs extended decerebrate rigidity is extension posture of both arms and legs with pronation of the arms so what is the mechanism to understand these mechanisms we should understand two important tracks one from the reticulo one from the red nucleus going to the spinal cord the rubro spinal tract second is the vestibular nucleus in the medulla oblongata going to the spinal cord vestibulo spinal tract the red nucleus is in the midbrain and the vestibular nucleus is in the medulla oblongata the rubro spinal tract that is coming from the red nucleus and going to the spinal cord the rubro spinal tract is responsible for flexion posture flexion of the upper limbs the vestibulo spinal tract is responsible for extension posture so red nucleus the rubro spinal tract is responsible for flexion posture the vestibular nucleus the vestibulo spinal tract is responsible for extension posture now imagine that there is a lesion above the red nucleus indirectly it implies that the red nucleus and the rubro spinal tract is import is intact the moment rubro spinal tract is intact person will have the features of rubro spinal tract stimulation that is they'll have flexion of the upper limb so decorticate rigidity indicates that there's a lesion above red nucleus and therefore rubro spinal tract is intact which produces flexion of the upper limbs and extension of the lower limbs so decorticate rigidity arm flexed and legs extended this is attributable to the intact rubro spinal pathways which enhance flexor tone to the upper extremities produced a, a flexed arm posture with an extended leg posture right now what is decerebrate rigidity imagine now there's a lesion between red nucleus and vestibular nucleus that is between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata so there is a lesion between the red nucleus and vestibular vestibular nucleus the rubro spinal tract is cut off 
because the lesion is below the red nucleus so it no more functions but since the vestibular nuclei and the vestibulospinal tract is intact because the lesion is above vestibular nucleus and therefore since the vestibulospinal tract is intact it produces extension so very interesting so decerebrate rigidity is extension posture of both arms and legs with a lesion between the red nucleus and vestibular nucleus the rubrospinal tract ceases to function but the vestibulospinal tract remains intact facilitating extensor tone to all the four extremities so here you can see the diagram the decorticate rigidity and the decerebrate rigidity in the decorticate rigidity the lesion is above the red nucleus so rubrospinal tract is intact producing flexion of the upper limbs you can see the diagram in the decerebrate rigidity the lesion is between the red nucleus and the vestibulospinal vestibular nucleus and therefore rubrospinal tract ceases to function vestibulospinal tract is intact and it causes extension of the limbs pronation of the arms so this is decorticate rigidity and decerebrate rigidity it helps in localization also so decorticate rigidity the lesion is above red nucleus decerebrate rigidity the lesion is between the red nucleus and the vestibular nucleus right now having completed the general physical examination now we shall focus on the neurologic examination arousal so we should see as i mentioned in the beginning of, of the class there are two important qualities of consciousness one is arousal second is cognition arousal is done by the brain stem ras system so how do we know the whether the person can be aroused or not tickling the nostrils with a cotton wisp pressure on the knuckles or bony prominences and pin prick stimulations are used to determine the threshold for arousal and the motor response of each side of the body next important is examination of the brain stem so the brain stem reflexes we have basically three important brain stem components one is the midbrain second is the pons and third is the medulla oblongata you you can see in the diagram the midbrain the midbrain is assessed by the pupillary reaction to light so when we throw light whether the pupils are contracting or not we we observe it so when we throw light if the pupils are constricting both direct and on the opposite side that means the midbrain is intact so we check out on the intactness of the midbrain by seeing the pupillary reaction to light if the pupils are reacting to light that means midbrain is intact then we have to assess the pons pons can be assessed by two important functions one is the corneal reflex second is the oculocephalic reflex the corneal reflex afferent is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve so fifth nerve is the pons and efferent is bilateral seventh nerve so seventh nerve is also on the pons so when we touch the cornea with a wisp of cotton ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is stimulated and both the eyelids close this is the corneal reflex here one another important clinical point is present the cornea does not have touch receptors it has only pain receptors the free nerve endings so when we touch the cornea we actually we are stimulating the pain receptors free nerve endings which are carried by ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and then goes to bilateral seventh nerve and the eyelids close which is known as corneal reflex perhaps nature has given this protection because cornea is very very important eyesight is very important and therefore it is not the touch receptors which are present they want to be over protective and therefore perhaps nature has given pain receptors free nerve endings on the cornea so corneal reflex we should see whether it is present or not second is the oculocephalic reflex oculocephalic reflex is that or oculovestibular reflex when we stimulate the vestibular component on one side the eyes go to the opposite side for example if i stimulate my vestibular complex on the on one side either by my turning the head to one side or putting warm water on the one side by stimulating the vestibular complex it goes and stimulates the opposite pprf so when it opposite pprf is stimulated the eyes go to the opposite side because of the lateral rectus and medial rectus through mlf 
So when the vestibular apparatus is stimulated by turning the head to one side or by pouring the warm water, eyes goes to the opposite side because of the PPRF stimulation and the frontal eye fields area number 8 tries to compensate, tries to put the eyes back, back to its normalcy by creating a nystagmus. So warm water, when you, when you put warm water, the eyes move to the opposite side, the nystagmus is to the same side. When we put cold water, this vestibular apparatus is inhibited. The opposite vestibular apparatus is stimulated, so eyes will move to the same side. The frontal eye fields area number 8 on this side will try to push the eyes to a normal position. So there is nystagmus. So cold opposite warm same, that's the mnemonic cause. So if the corneal reflex is intact, if the oculocephalic and oculovestibular reflexes are intact, that means pons is intact. And how do we test the medullary function? If the respiration is intact, if the person is able to breathe on his own spontaneously, that is medulla oblongata is intact. So this is how we test the brainstem reflexes, very important because consciousness depends on the brainstem, the RAS and both the cortices. So how we test the brainstem? Midbrain by pupillary reaction to light, pons by corneal reflex and oclocephalic reflex and medulla oblongata by spontaneous respiration. The oclocephalic reflex is because of the connection of the 8th nerve with the 3rd, 6th nerves through MLF medial longitudinal fasciculus as you can see the diagram. Yeah, so brainstem reflex. So what, what do we understand? How do we interpret this? Patients with preserved brainstem reflexes so, preserved brainstem reflexes typically have bihemispheric localization to coma, including toxic or drug intoxication. As we have discussed in the earlier part of the lecture, coma is produced either by brainstem interruption or destruction or bilateral hemispheric destruction. So, when the brainstem is intact in the form of preserved brainstem reflexes, the coma has to be because of the bihemispheric lesion it could be toxic or drug intoxication whereas patients with abnormal brainstem reflexes either have ras localization to their coma or suffering from herniation syndrome impact impacting the brainstem remotely from a cerebral mass lesion so if the brainstem reflexes are abnormal either the brainstem per se is affected or herniation from the cortex comes and impinges on the brainstem affecting the brainstem reflexes so by observing brainstem reflexes we can we can come to a conclusion that if the brainstem reflexes are present, that means brainstem is intact, the, the coma is because of the cortex. If the brainstem reflex are affected, the lesion is in the brainstem and the coma is because of the brainstem dysfunction. Right. Then we see the pupillary signs. The normal pupillary size is about 2.5 to 5 millimeters. If there is pupillary dilatation more than 6 millimeters, it indicates that there is a compression of the third nerve or severe midbrain damage or anticholinergic drugs. The parasympathetic fibers run superficially on the third nerve. Parasympathetic fibers causes constriction of the pupil. So, when the parasympathetic fibers of the third nerve are affected, the third nerve is present in the midbrain. So, if the compression of the third nerve is there or if there is severe midbrain damage, it results in the parasympathetic fibers being affected. So, it results in the pupillary dilatation. On the contrary, if there are small pupils, 1 to 2.5 millimeters, that means sympathetic pathway is affected. Sympathetic causes dilatation of the pupil and therefore the sympathetic is affected, that is small pupils. So in pontine hemorrhage, the basilar artery ruptures and both the sympathetic tracts get affected. So it results in both Horner's, bilateral Horner's syndrome producing small bilateral, bilateral small pupils or it could be hydrocephalus. Thalamic hemorrhage again affecting the sympathetic pathway causing small pupils or Horner syndrome. In all these conditions, the sympathetic pathway which causes dilatation of the pupil is affected and therefore it results in small pupils. Next is the spontaneous eye movements. The eyes look towards a hemispheric lesion and away from a brainstem lesion. So, ocular movements we assess two important comments. One, the spontaneous eye movements. That means we don't even touch the person. We go to the bedside and see the eye movements. They are spontaneous eye movements which are produced spontaneously. Second is the elicited eye movement. That is the oculocephalic 
manner which we do it so in spontaneous eye movements if the eye looks towards a eyes look towards a hemispheric lesion and away from a brain stem lesion what does this imply as we have just discussed in the oculocephalic reflex the vestibular apparatus the vestibular apparatus connects the PPRF on the opposite side which connects the lateral rectus on the opposite side and the medial rectus causing the eyes to move to one side. So when the oculocephalic and the vestibular apparatus is stimulated the eyes go to the one side and when it is affected eyes will move towards the same side. Frontal cortex also does the same thing. Frontal eye fields also connects to the PPRF but here it is a fast component. Frontal eye fields area number 8 also connects to the saccadic pathway to the PPRF and it stimulates the eyes to move to the opposite side. So when the frontal cortex gets affected, eyes cannot move to the opposite side, eyes will move to the same side but the corticospinal tract descends at the level of the medulla oblongata, crosses and goes to the opposite side. So eyes look to one side, hemiplegia on the opposite side, it is a frontal lobe in fact. Whereas if it is a pontine lesion, it cannot pull the eyes towards its side and therefore person's eyes will go to the opposite side. Hemiplegia is also on the opposite side because the corticospinal tract crosses at the level of the middle oblong and goes to the opposite side. So eyes will be looking towards the side of hemiplegia. If it is a pontine lesion, eyes looking to one side and hemiplegia on the opposite side, it is a frontal lesion or a hemispheric lesion. So continuing with the spontaneous eye movements, there are other two important movements, ocular bobbing and ocular dipping. Ocular bobbing is a brisk downward movement and slow upward movement of the eyes associated with loss of horizontal eye movements that is diagnostic of bilateral pontine damage. Pons is responsible for all horizontal eye movements and midbrain is responsible for vertical eye movements and therefore when pons gets affected there is loss of horizontal eye movements and a brisk downward and slow upward movements it is ocular bobbing suggestive of bilateral pontine damage. On the other hand ocular dipping it is just the opposite slow downward movement followed by a fast upper upward movement in a patient with the normal reflex horizontal gaze it is suggestive of diffuse cortical anoxic damage. Elicited eye movements as we just discussed Kausk cold opposite warm same. So when we put warm water the eyes goes to the opposite side the compensatory nystagmus is to the same side when we put cold water the vestibular apparatus is inhibited so this vestibular apparatus will, will push the eyes towards the same side front life fields will push the eyes to the opposite side so cold water the nystagmus is towards opposite side warm water the nystagmus is towards the same side herniation so now let's see the structural causes and metabolic causes structural causes one important concept we need to know is herniation what is herniation? It refers to the displacement of brain tissue by an overlying or adjacent mass into a contiguous compartment that it normally does not occupy. For example, uncus can get herniated and go into the infratemporal compartment which it normally does not occupy. So one of the common one of the common uh, uh, one of the common herniation syndromes is uncle herniation wherein uncus from the supratemporal goes into the intratemporal compartment which it normally does not occupy that is herniation. So actually when we see herniation from the rostrocaudal descent from in coming from the cerebral cortex, midbrain, pons, medulla we can see good breathing patterns evolving breathing patterns and, and the change in the posture also. So by looking at the respiratory pattern, the changing respiratory pattern, the changing posture, we can identify the lesion and, and, and get to know about the rostrocaudal herniation that is cerebral cortex. From the cerebral cortex when it descends to midbrain, when the herniation from the midbrain to the pons, from the pons to the medial oblongata. What are the changes? The respiratory pattern, if it is in the cerebral cortex, it will be change Stokes respiration, waxing, waning, waxing, waning and it produces a decorticate rigidity that is the flexion of the upper limb and extension of the lower limb. Flexion of the upper limb why because the lesion is above the red nucleus the rubrospinal tract is intact which causes flexion of the upper limb. When it comes to the midbrain the respiratory pattern is central neurogenic hyperventilation 
they keep on hyperventilating but when the red nucleus gets involved the rubrospinal tract is now cut off so vestibulospinal tract will take over vestibulospinal tract will cause extension so there will be decelebrate rigidity extension of the upper limbs with pronation because the lesion is between red nucleus and the vestibular nucleus so the rubrospinal tract is no longer intact so the manifestations that is the extension posture is because of the vestibulospinal tract when it comes to the pons it is apneustic breathing deep inspiration followed by expiration when it comes to medulla oblongata it becomes totally chaotic it is biots breathing so by looking at the breathing pattern and the posture we can even place the lesion whether it is a cerebral cortex midbrain pons or medulla so coma due to herniation there are various types of coma we have the uncle herniation the first one wherein the uncus comes from the supratentorial into the intratentorial compartment so this is one of the common herniations it goes and impinges on the midbrain the third nerve parasympathetic fibers on the third nerve so there will be pupillary dilatation so whenever there is hematoma we are, we are always bothered about whether there is any herniation especially uncle herniation how do we find out we check we look out on the pupillary size if one side the pupil is large the other side the pupil is normal it indirectly implies that it could be uncle herniation going and impinging on the midbrain wherein it goes and compresses the superficially placed parasympathetic fibers on the third nerve since parasympathetic causes constriction of the pupil since it's affected there will be dilatation of the pupil so asymmetry of the pupil anisocoria we should always suspect uncle herniation especially in a person with history of head injury so there will be unilateral dilatation of the pupil and since it goes and and uh, compresses the corticospinal tract there will be hemiplegia on the opposite side but sometimes the uncus can go and impinge on the opposite side of the midbrain so the manifestations will be on the same side that is hemipares will be on the same side plantar also will be extend, extensor on the same side that is about the uncle herniation then we have the central transtentorial herniation where in the the center part of the brain starts descending down it hits the thalamus and the top of the midbrain since the thalamus is affected the hypothalamic fibers get affected there will be small pupils then there is subfalcin herniation then there is extracranial herniation example when there is craniectomy is done the brain can herniate through the defective bone flap then there could be upward cerebellar herniation and finally very important is tonsillar downward cerebellar herniation wherein the cerebellum comes through into the foramen magnum and and all the important vital structures get affected uh, there will be raised ICT uh, it can produce Cushing's reflex that is bradycardia hypertension and irregular respiration and since the brainstem centers are affected it can result in a catastrophic manifestation so these are all the manifestation uncle hernia dilatation of the pupil and hemiplegia on the opposite side or sometimes it could be on the same side these are all the different types of brain herniation so uh, hemiplegia on the same side we call it as Carnohan sign coma due to metabolic cause now i have discussed structural causes now we will talk about the metabolic disorders Many systemic metabolic abnormalities cause coma by interrupting the delivery of energy substrates like oxygen, glucose, sodium or by altering neuronal excitability like epilepsy, anesthesia, drugs and alcohol. Metabolic encephalopathy generally they are gradual in onset unlike structural cause like, uh, like infarct or hemorrhage where it is sudden in onset metabolic encephalopathies they are gradual in onset so there will be at one end of the spectrum they are completely conscious then slowly they become confused clouded consciousness and finally coma so it will be gradual in onset so clouded consciousness and coma are actually in continuum in metabolic encephalopathy yeah so how do we clinically approach a person with in a comatose state as i said any person who comes in a comatose state either it could be structural causes which includes herniation 
or metabolic causes. So our first approach and broad important approach is to find out whether it's a structural cause of coma or a metabolic cause of coma. If it's a structural cause of coma, it usually produces focal signs. For example, there could be infarct, there could be hemorrhage, there could be tumor. So it, it will produce focal signs. There will be opposite hemiplegia or opposite side seizures. Whereas if it is metabolic disorders, usually it produces generalized bilateral signs. Very important clinical points. Focal signs always suspect structural causes. Bilateral and generalized disorders, generalized signs suspect metabolic disorders. And then in herniation, as I said, it could be uncle herniation. So what happens? It goes and impinches on the on the midbrain, the parasympathetic fibers running superficially on the third nerve. So pupils are usually affected if it is a structural cause of coma, like herniation. Whereas in metabolic disorders, pupils are usually not affected. There are exceptions like drug overdose, like opiate, but generally pupils are spared in metabolic disorders. So pupils are usually affected in structural causes. Pupils are usually not affected in metabolic disorders. Asterixis. Asterixis is not present in structural disorders, but asterixis is present in metabolic disorders. In a drowsy and confused patient, bilateral asterixis is a sign of metabolic encephalopathy or drug intoxication. What is asterixis? Extending the arm, spreading out the fingers, and then when we when we bend it, there will be an arrhythmic tremor, which is called as asterixis. So in a drowsy and confused patient, if there is bilateral asterixis, it's a sign of metabolic encephalopathy or drug intoxication. So asterixis is not present in structural cause, but bilateral asterixis is a sign of metabolic encephalopathy or drug intoxication. And asterixis is thought to be because of the posterior column involvement at the level of the parietal lobe. And because of that, the position joints in, they are not able to sustain a particular posture, posture. So it drops and then they try to correct it. It drops and then they try to correct it. That's why it's known as asterixis. And herniation, structural cause, usually the CT and MRI is abnormal. It could be tumor, it could be infarct, it could be hemorrhage. So CT scan and MRI picks up. Whereas metabolic disorders, it is because of the metabolic parameter abnormal like hyponatremia, hypoglycemia or hypoxemia. So CT and MRI is usually normal in metabolic disorders. In herniation of structural disorders, blood investigations are usually normal because it is hemorrhage or infarction or tumor. Blood investigations are normal. Whereas in metabolic disorders, uh, where it could be because of hypoglycemia or hyponatremia, blood investigations are usually abnormal. Like it could be a low glucose level or low sodium level. So these are five very, very important points when we approach a case of coma to differentiate whether it's a structural cause of coma or a metabolic cause of coma. Lab studies and imaging. Then how do we proceed? The lab studies. First, we need to do chemical and toxicologic analysis of blood and urine like glucose, sodium or alcohol. ABG arterial blood gas analysis to find out whether there are lung disorders. CT, MR and MRI will be useful to find out structural causes like extradural hematoma, or subdural hematoma or stroke. EEG is very useful, especially in non-convulsive seizures when they don't have the typical tonic-clonic movements and the, and the seizures, the clinical seizures are not obvious and they are not convulsive, non-convulsive seizures, it can be picked up by EEG. So EEG is very useful in picking up non-convulsive seizures resulting in coma. Uh, it can pick up CJD and HSV, have herpes simplex, encephalitis, Kurzweil jacob disease where they have the periodic shock waves. If there are triphasic waves coming up on EEG, we think of a metabolic encephalopathy, especially hepatic encephalopathy. And benzodiazepine overdose produces widespread beta activity. Then CSF analysis is very useful for finding out meningitis and encephalitis. So coma, what are the differential diagnoses of coma? There are so many causes of coma, but almost all the causes of coma will fit into one of these three categories. One, coma without focal neurologic signs. There are no focal neurologic signs like metabolic and toxic encephalopathies. Coma with prominent focal signs like structural cause, stroke, cerebral hemorrhage. Coma with meningitis syndrome characterized by fever or stiff neck or excess of spell cells in the spinal fluid like meningitis, encephalitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the differential diagnosis of coma, all cause of coma will fit into one of these three categories. 
coma without focal neurologic signs that is the metabolic encephalopathies like hypoglycemia hyponatremia coma with prominent focal signs like stroke or cerebral hemorrhage coma with meningitis syndrome characterized by fever or stiff neck and excess of cells in the spinal fluid like meningitis encephalitis and sah cva is one of the important cause of coma especially in the elderly so what is the differential diagnosis of cva causing coma so what are the clinical signs if it is basal ganglion thalamic hemorrhage pontine hemorrhage cerebellar hemorrhage basilar artery thrombosis or sah or mca stroke in basal ganglia or thalamic hemorrhage there is hemiparesis and eyes look down and the pupils are small why in thalamic hemorrhage eyes are looking down thalamic hemorrhage goes and impinges on the top of the midbrain the midbrain is sent is the center for vertical eye movements vertical eye movements are of two types up gaze and down gaze up gaze fibers cross over and then descend down gaze fibers descend straight away so when there is thalamic hemorrhage it is very close to the rostral part of the midbrain so it impinges on the top of the midbrain so it compresses the crossing up gaze fibers but not the down gaze fibers which de which descend straight away directly and therefore up gaze fibers are affected so they cannot look upwards they'll be looking downwards why there are small pupils the sympathetic causes dilatation of the pupil sympathetic starts from the hypothalamus that is very close to thalamus and since there is thalamic hemorrhage the sympathetic tract gets affected so the dilatation of the pupil gets affected so it results in small pupils pontine hemorrhage there is pinpoint pupils loss of reflex eye movements and cor corneal responses and ocular bobbing why there are pinpoint pupils in pontine hemorrhage when there is a basilar artery rupture it diffuses to both sides so both sympathetic tracts get affected so they cannot dilate so there will be pinpoint pupils on both sides Pons is center for all horizontal eye movements so there will be loss of reflex eye movements corneal reflex the center is the pons ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve bilateral seventh nerve so corneal responses get affected ocular bobbing as i said is a brisk downward movement followed by slow upward movements with loss of reflex eye movements suggestive of a pontine lesion cerebellar hemorrhage when there's cerebellar hemorrhage there is occipital headache vomiting gaze paresis especially if there's a direction changing nystagmus we should be suspecting cerebellar hemorrhage vestibular nystagmus or labyrinthine nystagmus usually is on only one side whereas if if the direction of the nystagmus the direction of the nystagmus keeps changing we should think of central cause like cerebellar hemorrhage that is they may beat to one side once they come to the center and go to the other side they may start beating on the other side this is known as direction changing nystagmus so if there's a direction changing nystagmus we should suspect a central cause like a cerebellar hemorrhage basilar artery thrombosis pons gets involved so there will be diplopia third fourth sixth nerves get affected sixth nerves gets affected so there will be diplopia double vision on looking at the far off objects there could be dysarthria so with this diplopia or dysarthria you should suspect uh, brain stem especially basilar artery thrombosis sub diaphragmatic hemorrhage there is sudden severe headache vomiting and loc there may not be any neurologic signs why is there sudden severe headache in sah and meningitis the brain is by and large insensitive to pain even if the brain is cut there is no pain you cut brain there is no pain because brain is largely insensitive to pain only the meninges and the vessels in the meninges are very sensitive to pain and in subarachnoid hemorrhage since the meninges get affected and in meningitis since the meninges get inflamed in both conditions since the meninges are involved there will be severe pain because meninges and vessels in the meninges produce pain they are pain sensitive whereas brain is pain insensitive that's why infarct mc infarct does not produce pain because brain has not got any pain receptors whereas subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis they produce pain and headache so sudden severe headache vomiting los loc always suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage mca stroke though it is the most common stroke syndrome it may not cause coma unless there's a massive cerebral edema as i said in the initial part of my lecture if one cerebral cortex gets affected person does not lose consciousness for a person to lose consciousness both the cortices or the brain stem should get affected so in an mca stroke if only one cortex gets affected person does not lose consciousness because the other cortex is there to compensate so mca stroke can produce coma only when one cortex is affected and there's massive edema going and and going to the other side and affecting the cerebral cortex or the brain stem then only a person loses consciousness uh, mca stroke without massive edema usually does not lose consciousness
So for a person to lose consciousness, both the cortices should get affected. If one cortex gets affected, person does not lose consciousness. Both the cortices should get affected or brainstem should get affected. A big MCA stroke, person does not lose consciousness. Whereas a simple hypoglycemia, person loses consciousness. Why? When there is hypoglycemia, when the glucose is on the lower side, the entire RAI system gets affected in a diffuse manner. So a hypoglycemia, simple hypoglycemia can produce loss of consciousness and coma. But a big MCA stroke may not produce coma unless there is a massive edema because only one side, one cortex is affected. Very important clinical point. So what is the treatment of coma? If there is hypoglycemia, we give IV dextrose. Very important because a highly treatable condition. A person comes in hypoglycemic state, give dextrose, person immediately recovers. But a word of caution, alcoholics with hypoglycemia, always we need to give thiamine along with glucose to avoid provoking Wernick's encephalopathy. Alcoholics, they have, they don't take food well and on top of it, they have thiamine deficiency. So when we give dextrose, whatever little thiamine is left out, thiamine is left, that is also utilized. And therefore, we may provoke the person to develop Wernick's encephalopathy. So therefore persons, therefore alcoholics with hypoglycemia, always we need to give thiamine and then followed by dextrose to avoid provoking Wernick's encephalopathy which is because of thiamine deficiency. Narcotic overdose we give naloxone, stroke CVA thrombolysis or mechanical embolectomy, diazepam overdose, flumazenil, ethylene glycol, fomipizole, Sometimes when we are not sure person comes in coma and deteriorating, we can try out coma cocktail consisting of dextrose, flumazenil, naloxone and thiamine is sometimes used in the initial management of the comatose patient. So this is known as coma cocktail consisting of dextrose, flumazenil, naloxone and thiamine. Prognosis. Metabolic comas have a far better prognosis than traumatic ones. So metabolic coma like hypoglycemia and hyponatremia, they have a far better prognosis than traumatic ones. The absence of the cortical responses of the somatosensory evoked potential has been shown to be a strong indicator of poor outcome following hypoxic injury. So when we do somatic sensory evoked potential, that is the posterior column, uh, and then there is the absence of cortical responses, that means the cortex is affected, that means it indicates a person has got uh, is in a severe, uh, has got a very bad prognosis. Sometimes we use Glasgow Coma Scale, especially in persons with head injury. Glasgow Coma Scale is used in the evaluation of patients with impaired consciousness, particularly in head injury. So we use in persons with impaired consciousness, but particularly in head injury, we use a scale called as Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, which has got three important components, eye opening, best verbal response and best motor response. We call that as EMV, eye response, motor response and verbal response. Totally there are 15 points, the highest is 15, the least is 3 points because if there is no response in any of these 3 components, we give 1 point each. So what are the 3 components and how, and how are we going to give the points? For eye opening, eye opens spontaneously, we give 4 points, eye opens only to verbal stimuli, 3 points opens only to pain 2 points and never opens is 1 point. Best verbal response oriented and converses 5 points, disoriented and confused 4 points, inappropriate word 3 points, incomprehensible sounds 2 points and no verbal sounds 1 point. Best motor response obeys command 6 points, localizes pain 5 points, withdraws to pain 4 points, Decorticate rigidity 3 points, decerebrate rigidity 2 points, no motor response 1 point. As I said, the highest GCS score is 15 by 15, but lowest GCS score is not 0, it is 3 by 15. We give 1 point each even if there is no response. Yeah, uh, most of the points of neurology I try to put in a question answer format in a book called Focus Neurology. Uh, I am the medical author of this book, Focus Neurology. S. Srinivas, it is published by CBS Publishers and Distributors. So most of the important fascinating points of neurology, I have put it in a question answer format in, in my book, Focused Neurology, uh, which I have authored, I am the medical author of this book. So if, uh, if people are interested, they can buy it on, online, uh, it will be very useful. And uh, this lecture, coma and the consciousness, the important concepts, I thought uh, uh, it was very fascinating to discuss.
and i hope you have also enjoyed listening to my lecture if you have any suggestions or comments kindly post on to my youtube channel but please like and subscribe my youtube channel dr srinivas medical concepts and my fb page dr srinivas concepts thank you bye